the story that I'm thinking of now is related to learning the ASL classes that we have here. So there was a student named Ethan who was really, he was interested in learning American Sign Language here at school. And he wasn't really sure how would be the best way to pursue that at school. So I think he met with one of our staff members and they sort of weren't sure how much the interest would grow at the school. Mm. So they decided just to make a sign. He put it up on, we had like a happenings board Mm. where anyone who's interested could sign up to learn, you know, American Sign Language. And quite a few people signed up and we started meeting and just learning off of the internet at first. And some people ended up dropping out and whatever. But when Mm -hmm. we got down to this core group of people, we spent months every week, meeting every week for like an hour for months, learning off of the internet. And a year later, we came back and we were all really interested in continuing Hmm. to learn sign language. And we wanted to know what the next best way to do it was. We're like, we're done with just learning it off of YouTube. We want something better. Hmm. And recently, last year, we ended up getting a ASL instructor, a deaf teacher who was going to school to become an interpreter, who would come in and do classes with us every week. And the student who actually started that is now at college where some big part of that is his ASL experience. I'm not sure if he's majoring in it, minoring in it, but it's like ASL is one of their big programs there. Hmm. And the amount of people who are learning ASL has just grown since we got the instructor. And so I think it's been really beneficial to the school community to have like this learning experience that so many people are interested in Mm. and have been able to achieve and figure out together like how we could make it happen so we had some issues with like how are we going to pay our instructor like where's the money going to come from and what are we going to do with that Uh uh-huh and you're able to to go to the school meeting and and get that handled i take it we had one of our staff members who's helping us we figured out she kind of helped us figure out ways that we could get like grants for oh. our instructor. Yeah. And it, it also actually, I think sort of encouraged, but also coincided with a shift in the way that our school government allocates resources and funding. So um, at the end of last school year, we created something called a resource committee that has a multi-thousand dollar budget line item each year. And can in- nice. any student can go to that. And it's, it's a little bit more accessible than a school meeting. Mm-hmm. To get money to for either materials or or instruction or experiences, help with field trip money, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like that really benefited the school to again sort of demonstrate what is possible. That if you mm-hmm. if you have a group of people who have demonstrated serious interest in this thing and they are sort of exhausting the resources that we currently have on campus to show, well, here's a path towards gaining more expertise than Mm. what we already have available here. This is the Agentic Schools Vodcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. What makes education possible is the satisfaction of psychological needs. So that is what these schools have in common with all others. What makes a school agentic is satisfying those needs particularly well. I'm your host, Don Berg.